Thank you for having me at this event. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I, I was here a couple of years ago. I, I was here in 2018. I thought it was a really great event. So great that in 2019, I bought 100 tickets for my team. And uh, I've since moved on to another company. I, I did put a, a PR in before I left. And, and there's a number of people, number here from my, my previous company who are, are here. So I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about my journey from uh, not just an individual contributor, but someone who changed careers. I was well established in my career as a civil engineer, and, and I decided to move to IT in the, the 1970s. Excuse me, the base slide just jumped, and I got confused. But I, uh, I, I jumped careers, and I haven't looked back. It's been really, really great. So uh, I'd like, if you have questions, please keep them to the end. Uh, a quick disclaimer, I work for a company called Industrial Refrigeration Pros. You can kind of see on the monitor the pictures of, of we do industrial refrigeration, so a, a room this size, if you needed it, it refrigerated for, uh, you know, food or, or, or a medical uh, supply, right? That's kind of what we do. And, and my opinions are my own. I'm going to say some things here that are controversial today, nothing that are going to get the organizers in trouble, but maybe some opinions that, that go against the norm. So uh, they're my opinions. A quick background on me. I, I grew up in Massachusetts in the 70s and 80s. Back then, it really wasn't called IT. It was called high tech. And it was Silicon Valley, and it was a Boston area. And so in the Boston area, you had companies such as uh, digital equipment, prime computer, Apollo computer, Wang, right? The whole mini computer. Uh, field was, was often had, you know, those, those companies were located in, in the Boston area. And then, you know, throughout the 90s, there was a, a lot of opportunities in, in IT. Uh, I had went to school for civil engineering. I graduated in 91, not knowing anything about computers, honestly. I had to take a Fortran course, but I really didn't understand it. And I graduated and I got a job for the Massachusetts Highway Department. So I worked there for about five years. I, I then went to a consulting company. Uh, but I still had this desire to do something different. Engineering really wasn't for me. And then and six years in, it was, it was pretty clear. I studied. I, I talked to people whom, whom I knew who were in it. I, I bought a number of books. You know, Back then, there was no such thing as this online learning that you have now. There's so much free learning. There's so much great content online. Back then, you either went to a school at night or you bought these big, thick books that were 800 pages, and you had to read them. So that's what I did. And I bought uh, two computers. I built them. I connected them together. I got a non-commercial copy of NT Server. And, and then I went and applied through a contracting agency for NEC. I had to take a test. I did reasonably well on the test, not awesome, but, but well enough. I, I had an interview. The, the day of the interview, it snowed. Two of the interviewers didn't show up. I, I went, I, I was there, I, and I, I got the job. And that was a really magical time for me in 97. I, I really in, enjoyed it. It was a complete change. It was a, something that I felt good about. And, and so I've been in this ever since. Uh, as I've worked my way up, I, I've worked my way up through the NEC. I, I've worked at startups that were 11 people. I've, I worked at Microsoft on the Office 2010 and SQL Server Kilimanjaro releases. I've worked for an Australian-based company. I had a team all over the world. And, and I most recently at GM Financial, where I, I was working on the cloud area. But today, I, I'm running... Uh, as a CIO for a private equity-backed company, which is Industrial Refrigeration Pros. And, and if you look at this deck here, the slide, I mean, this is everything that I do or I'm responsible for in my role. Now, this is pretty much the same thing all, all CIOs are responsible for, except that, you know, it's a, as a smaller company, it it's not, doesn't quite have that same depth. The first point I want to mention of my, of my lessons learned and mistakes I've made is this concept of career velocity. When I was at the Mass Highway Department, I had been there four years. I was a civil engineer one was my title. And, and I had civil engineer threes and civil engineer fives reporting to me. 
but I was still a civil engineer one. And, and organic promotions weren't really something that was going to happen in the next few years. I had talked to people internally about my career, and, and my boss was named Joe. He had a brother who had worked at the highway department and went to private industry. So I arranged an interview with, with his brother, Brother Jim, to, to see if I could go work for that company, what I would need to know, what, what skills and experiences I, I would need. And so I had the interview. One thing, the first question that was asked was, oh, what do I have to offer? And I said, I have four years' experience. And he said, stop right there. You don't have four years' experience. You have one year' experience four times over. And that was a really hard thing to, to hear. It was awkward. And, but in, in this case, it was very true. Despite the fact that I had worked four years and, and did have people working for me and had more projects, I wasn't incrementally growing my skills. And to this individual, Jim, I didn't have four years of value that he needed. I just had one year of value four times over. And if I was hired, I would pretty much start at the bottom. And I've remembered that, and, and this is kind of one of these uh, lessons I, I look back on. You know, and this goes back to 96, right? But I, I still remember it, and that's why it's, it's in my presentation here, because it has been so important. Many times you'll, you'll see you know, job postings where they want incremental experience. And this is an example of, of what companies look for. And so if you are aspiring to, to do greater things, it, it's important for you to continue to demonstrate that you're growing and taking on more responsibility or more, more projects. Another example of, of where this hit me, even though I, I should have learned a lesson earlier on, is at Microsoft. I had been at Microsoft for three years, and, and all of a sudden, out of the blue, I did during my review, they said, look, you've been in your role three years and it's pretty much up or out here. And, and why have you been in your role for three years? And there was a number of reasons why, right? But ultimately, I share some responsibility for, for not advancing faster. Now, I didn't get underperform my review. I still got a meets expectation, but, but they were, were pretty clear that as a, an S.2, the expectation was that I... I advance very quickly or find other opportunities. And, and so, uh, so this stuff does happen, and, and I just want you to be aware of it. it it's something that, that I've, I've worked through in, in my career. The other piece I have on this is, is your title matters. And I know this, a lot of people will disagree with this. There are some people say it shouldn't be that way. And I can say, sure, you're correct. and it still happens. A real world example that happened to me this year is, is when I work for General Motors Financial, that is, uh, your GM is, we call it a top 10 car manufacturer, right? And, and there was another top 10 car manufacturer that had a CIO role open for their captive finance. So I thought, you know what? I can do that role. Let me apply to it. And, and I applied for it. I didn't hear anything. And, and so, uh, about a week later, I reached out to someone whom I thought was the, the talent lead that was filling that role, and I was correct, and, and I kind of recommended that they interview me and, uh, for the CIO role. So I, I had a call with her, and, and she asked me, and she was really pinning me down. I was like, what was my exact role and title at, at GM Financial? And, 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 and what she told me was that the, the selection committee was only considering people who'd been a CIO at another company. Now, if you think about auto finance and the top 10 car manufacturers, there's only nine other ones that have CIOs, right? But they were willing to take someone with no auto finance experience because that person had been a CIO over someone who had worked and understood all the systems, all, all the different components and ways that the company can make money. And, and, and so they, they passed on me, and I followed up a month later. They still didn't, didn't fill the role. And then about two and a half months later, someone I know who had been a CIO reached out to me for advice because a retained search recruiter reached out to him about that particular role still being open, and, and did, did I have advice for him on how auto finance worked, and could I give him the, the lowdown on, on that whole thing? So that was just interesting. So, so I think... 
titles do matter, and I think the, the career velocity does matter. And, and so my recommendations for you, as you look at your own career, is, is where are you going? And if you are stuck or you feel stuck, look introspectively and say, what can you do differently in the op in the op with the opportunity you have? Do you need to go someplace else? Is there a way for you to provide additional value in your organization as it stands? Or, or do you have to leave, right? Leaving can be hard, but, but sometimes you do have to leave. And if you look at many of the people who have advanced very quickly, often they're switching companies and they go up and up and up. So but I would like you to think about being intentional and, and being open to pivoting. And uh, also be open to listening to when people reach out to you about opportunities. Uh, this opportunity that I have right now, it was a referral, and uh, someone reached out to me. I met him at a Starbucks, had a, uh, an offer half hour later. So the other piece of career velocity and, and the component that's really helped me is, is writing your goals down. And I was writing my goals down every single day, so I'd get those yellow pads of paper that you know the, you get them in like a tin pack. And every day I'd write my goals down in the affirmative. And, and there's a number of different uh, tools and, and podcasts you can listen to on goal setting. Uh, there's one I used to like, uh, Andy Frisella. He had the the MF CEO podcast, and I used to listen to that. And there was some, some really great content about goal setting there. Soft skills are, are one of those uh, areas where I think I can always improve, and I think many people probably have opportunities to improve too. Uh, the first one that I'm putting as a soft skill, though you could argue it isn't, is know how your company makes money. Right? You know, often people, especially in a large, larger organization, it's not clear to the end, end employee how the company makes money and how that employee contributes to the bottom line. Uh, we often focus on internal customers, meaning you know my internal customers are development groups, or my internal customer is the marketing team, but I think people sometimes don't look at the actual customer who's buying their product. And, and so my, my first point is to understand how the company makes money and who your customers are, the customers that pay you for your product or service. The second point I have is, it relates back to a conference I went at in 2014. There was a speaker, and he was speaking, and he used the term IT and the business. During his presentation, he said that, and someone stood up in the audience and just yelled, there is no IT and the business, IT is the business. And then a bunch of people clapped and cheered, and it was really awkward for the speaker. I felt bad for him. but. But when we think about what the role of a CIO is or the role of IT is to deliver business value through technology. And, and so a lot of times you'll hear the term IT needs to be the order shaper, not the order taker. And so point two is to make sure that as you work with your business partners in the organization, you're providing solutions. You're showing how IT can be the differentiator, how you can use I, IT to increase your, your bottom line, and that goes back to number one, of, of knowing how your company makes money. The third point I have on my soft skills is some advice I got by a manager named John Savastis back in 1988, and that was when I worked at the supermarket at, in the first year of college. And he said, you know, come here, kid, right? And he says, you know, God gave you two ears, two eyes, and one mouth. Use what he gave you most of. And, uh, and so that's, that was basically meant to shut up. But I, I think it's good advice, especially as you, you, know, you go through leadership and you start uh, increasing your ability to, uh, to influence larger teams and larger organizations, is to be able to listen and observe and, and see how you can provide that that value through those, those senses as opposed to just talking. And uh, so I still remember this from, from 1989, 88, 89 area. The fourth point of soft skills relates back to 
uh, a movie called Pretty Woman. Many of you have probably seen it with Richard Gere and uh, Julia Roberts. So there was a point where you know, Julia Roberts had got the dress and she was in the restaurant. And so when Richard Gere came back, the, the hotel manager you know, said, you know, sir, your, your niece is in, in the restaurant waiting for you. And so Richard Gere says, I think we both know she's not my niece. But what, what happened was, you know, he was giving him an out, right? The hotel manager knew that he, she wasn't his niece, but he was giving Richard Gere an out. And, and something that was called to my attention at one point was I really wasn't giving people an out. I was trapping them, and I, I may not have been intentionally trapping them, but through my behaviors, I was not giving people an out, and so therefore I was trapping them, and then as a result of that, they would fight back. And so it's trying to find a way when someone isn't doing what you need or they've made a mistake, uh, to think about like that no blame postmortem, but think of it more in other cases too, where it's not really a postmortem event like an outage, but it's you're trapping someone and you may not even be aware you're doing it. So just think of the movie Pretty Woman and, and hopefully you will uh, know not to do this. Uh, another soft skill that, that sometimes is hard for people in IT to grasp and, and not to do indirectly, it's uh, it's making people feel stupid. Now, when I worked for the mining software company, I had an SVP of sales that sat beside me, and, and he was a little high strung. And then one day, he's just yelling, and he says, Brad, how could you be so incredibly stupid? And he's talking to one of his employees like that. Now, I know everyone here knows that's inappropriate not to do that, but we also have to be careful of our nonverbal body language and, and our, facial, our facial expressions and, and how we answer questions because we may not intentionally be trying to make someone feel stupid, but due to our actions and due to our demeanor, we might be. And so an example of this, there was a, a White House press secretary, I'm not going to say who she was or what the president president, who the president was, it doesn't really matter, but the White House, White House press corps would ask her really inappropriate questions, and when she's being asked a question, you can see her facial expression just change, and like, she's like, like, do you really believe that question you're asking me? But you know, we have to make sure that we're not doing that in the corporate environment, and it's hard because the people who go to a conference like this, many of you are very technical, and this stuff comes to you like second nature, but for a lot of people it doesn't. And, and this is an area where you know, I've, I've needed to improve and I think uh, I, always, I continue to need to improve. So another piece of advice I got you know, this year and last at, at my last company was, was, was meet people where they are, right? If we're trying to get to level 10, and most people are at level 2, it, it's you know, meeting them at level 2 and really helping and working hard to bring them along the journey. Now, you can believe that they should be at a 7 or 8 already, but they're not, right? And no matter how much you insist that they need to be there, you still have to meet them at, at where they are, say, at level 2, and work them down and work them up. So... And then always try to lead people better after you've talked to them than, than before. And I know that's not always possible, but, but that's something I, I would like to, to do better. And then, then the last one here is, is when people leave for a new role, uh, be glad that you gave them the, the skills to, to get to that new role. So when your people leave and, and they get another opportunity, just take pride in knowing that they were able to advance because of some of what you gave them. If we look at how the CIO role or, or other roles at the, the C level have, have changed over the years, right? the CIO was typically a very technical role, and then it, the pendulum really seemed to pivot 
to a point where the CIO was a, a business leader, was a relationship builder, was someone who had empathy. And it's starting, I've seen it the past couple of years starting to swing back where you know, these senior leadership roles still need a lot of technical skill. And, and this is where I, I sometimes disagree with some of my peers. But in my, my last organization, I was also a board member of the Society of Information Management. And, and on the board, my job was to help members in transition. So people who, the term in transition means unemployed, right? And, and so for people who they, they were fired or they got laid off or whatever reason, and I would help mentor them, I would help them with their resume, I would help try to find them opportunities. And, and so many started off in technical roles 20 years earlier, but they were so far from from understanding current technology. And, and it's very unlikely that a CIO today is gonna to be asked to restore a Kubernetes cluster, right? It's probably not something that would ever be asked. But there's a, a line between understanding what Kubernetes is, understanding containerization, understanding how technology is built today versus how it was built, I don't know, 20 years ago. And as an example, I, I spent about an hour on the phone with someone a few months ago trying to teach him what containers were, what Kubernetes was, what uh, DevOps was, what continuous integration was. Because he had an interview, and this was going to be part of his interview, because he was going to be taking over teams that included development teams, and the organization expected him to be able to set the example and, and be able to lead this. And so I was able to give him enough skill that he could then uh, answer the questions, have an understanding. But as you advance and as you get into management, I think it's still very, very important for you to keep up your tactical acumen. Uh, I've just seen so much of that. And many CIOs will argue the point that they don't need to do this. But when they're looking for jobs and they're continually coming back with, they didn't understand this, they didn't understand that, or they asked some technical questions and they weren't able to answer them, they're starting to sense that yes, they have maybe not kept up with it as, as long as they, they could have, or they should have. Uh, there was a woman named, well there was a woman named Kathleen Vignos, and she, last I knew she worked for Twitter, and she gave a really great talk at the Velocity Conference a few years ago. As part of that, she stated that in Silicon Valley, you know, age discrimination can be executed by asking technical questions. So they might ask you technical questions and, and you can't answer them because you're so far from that technology. Uh, she had a really great talk, you might be able to find it on YouTube, but she talks about in her talk how to help fight through the age discrimination. You know, one of the, the individuals I, I mentored had a resume, it was kind of plain, right? Nothing wrong with the resume so much as it was just nothing that popped out, nothing that was just, wow. And, and, but he did have a certification in there from 2007, and I told him to remove that because I said, it's 2021, and the last certification you have is 2007. It basically says you haven't learned anything new in 14 years, so you should definitely remove that from the resume as opposed to calling attention to, to that so when you had your, your last certification. Uh, so I'm a big believer that those in, in leadership roles in IT need to continue to keep their technical acumen up. You need to be able to set the example for your team. You need to uh, let them know that you're also part of that same journey they are. Uh, I've, I've earned a lot of respect from my team members from, from being on that same journey with them. I'm, I'm a big believer in certification. I know it doesn't make you an expert at anything, but it does help you understand the technology and it does help you set that example for your teams. So, One of the items that I, I think has been important for me is, is how I've branded myself over, over the years. Uh, back when I, I worked at Microsoft, Microsoft had a role named technical evangelist. 
and it looked like a role I might want to do. And because I worked internally at Microsoft, I, I could see who that team was and, and reach out to them. And I asked someone, you know, how do I become a technical evangelist? And so I think we set up a call. It was very quick. But he asked me, he said, you know, this, and I'm paraphrasing a conversation from 2008, but it was, you know, this is the, the technical evangelist was the easiest job to get at Microsoft. I'm like, oh, great, tell me more. And he says, well, do you have a blog? I'm like, no. He said, do you speak at conferences? I said, no. He said, do you have a website? I said, no. He says, well, you're not a technical evangelist. The way it works is you come to us with that, and then you explain to us you are an evangelist, and we hire you. I was like, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> so uh, I didn't, I, I thought about that, right? And then I kind of changed jobs. And then back in, in 2012, I was reading an article from Martha Heller in CIO.com. So Martha Heller is a CIO recruiter out of Natick, Massachusetts, and she writes for CIO.com. She said that in that article that her clients were looking for uh, leaders who uh, had a following on social media, who spoke at conferences, were seen as thought leaders. And I said, wow, I, I guess I have to do this social media thing. I was really against it back then. Still kind of against it today, but, but I, I think it's just something I have to work with. And, and so back then I, I started with, with trying to intentionally build my brand. And, uh, and, and so my ask of you is for you to start trying to build your brand. There's a lot of easy ways for you to do this. It just puts you know, just a little bit of effort on your part. Uh, the first thing is to write articles. I mean, you can write articles and post them on LinkedIn. You can post them on Medium.com. You can go to different uh, organizations who have newsletters, who have magazines. They're always looking for content. They're always looking for content, and you can uh, shop your articles there, and you have a really good chance of building that up and getting better, and then you're continuing to develop your own skills, both your soft skills and your tactical skills, by writing these articles. The next is, is to speak at events such as DevOps Days, or maybe you, know, you want to start with a different meetup group. I mean, in the DFW area, there are hundreds of different meetup groups, and, and many of them are IT. And let me tell you exactly how this, this works, right? So you get two people, and they decide, we're going to have a meetup group on Azure. And they're going to say, you know what? Sanjay will speak at the first meeting. And then Lisa's going to speak at the second one. And then Quan's going to talk on the third one. And then by the time it comes to the fifth meetup, they have no one to talk, to, to, to talk at their event. And it kind of fizzles out. So you can reach out to these meetup groups and explain, hey, you know, I have a story to tell, or I'd like to speak on this subject, or this project that I worked on, or this solution to a problem. And more than likely, you know, they are going to accept your desire to speak at their event. And that's how you get practice. That's how you get into this, right? You also have GitHub, right? Many people have a GitHub site. Uh, not everyone's using it. But I recommend you get a GitHub site. I recommend you put that on your resume. Uh, and uh, I, every resume that came in to me that had a GitHub link, I went to that link, right? Every single one. And, and the reason for that is I want to see what that person's doing. And if that person is uh, updating documentation because there was a documentation problem on some site and, and that person said, oh, you know, I can fix that documentation, make it clearer, that's great. I mean, not everyone's going to be a coder. But if you can contribute to GitHub and different public site, you know, public projects, that shows that you can work with a remote team. That shows you can contribute. That shows you know how to, you understand the process. That goes a long way, and and that can't be falsified, right? That is you, right? Uh, you can also be podcast guests, right? There's so many people who have podcasts, right? I mean, there's huge podcasts, but there's also smaller ones or ones that are vendor-sponsored. I mean, you can go and, and apply and, and uh, reach out and, and try to be on those, right? There are so many different opportunities for you to build your brand and to be a positive influence. This goes a long, long way. And, and here's another reason why, aside from just your career growth, is most resumes that I'd get at my last job were, what, 90% were completely falsified, right? I would see people who claimed to work on Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes service, before it was invented. So one candidate worked on it, like, two years before Microsoft invented it, all right? And that was a complete falsification. Or there was one template DevOps engineer resume, and I saw the same... 12 bullet points on three different resumes from three different staffing agencies, the same exact resume, right? Different dates, 
different name, different job, same verbatim copied from a template site. And so for you as you know, ethical and honest individuals working hard to build your career, you're sometimes f fighting against fraud. But if you have a social media branding and you have you know, links to, you spoke at these conferences and there's a hyperlink to the conference. So you've written this article, it's a hyperlink to the article. If you receive these awards, there's a, a link to it in your resume. That, or there's a GitHub link, right? That shows who you are and that can't be falsified. And, and so a, as you look, right, there's a lot of demand. There's a lot of companies that have been, you know, offering roles that are uh, paying at maybe higher than other companies, there's a, there's a lot of fraud, right? There's fraud from individuals, there's fraud from uh, staffing agencies. And so by building your brand this way, you protect yourself against that because no one can accuse you of the fraud because you have all those links. Raise your hand if you have a mentor. There's a, I, I, it's hard, not that many of you, uh, probably 30. Uh, mentorship is something that I didn't ask for early enough in my career. Uh, and I should have, when I was at the Mass Highway Department, I made a decision on my professional engineer application that kind of affected my long-term prospects in that field because I didn't, choose the right options, and it's my fault, but if I had a mentor, I, I wouldn't have done that. Uh, as I, I started really focusing on my career in, in 2012, I, I started reaching out to different leaders in the, the Denver area, and I had a very simple email, right? I mean, you can't really ask for mentorship because it's like asking someone to get married, right? It, it's, it's a commitment, but I would just had a, a quick three paragraph email, you know, hi, my name is Tom Sweet. Um, uh, I've watched your, I've looked at your career progression. I'd like to meet with you and, and have you give me some advice on where I need to go. I mean, something short like that. And, and, and I've got to mention five names here, and it's not to name drop, it's just a decade later, these individuals are still in my mind because of the commitment and the, the one hour they gave me. And the first is Cheryl Tilly. She was CIO of a gold company. Now she's CIO of uh, Nikola Motors in, in uh, Arizona. And then Jim Galke, he's now CIO of Regis College. Uh, you know, JP Batra was CTO of, of Cool River. And then Rob Mylan was part of uh, Hunter Douglas. Now he's at Gartner. And then and Marina Johnson was uh, at HSS. So, so these five individuals gave me an hour and they gave me advice. And a decade later, uh, I still remember that, right? And so people like that are out there and you have access to them. They are not any different than you. They're willing to help you. You just have to come to the table and show that you're willing. And I don't think there's a reason why you know, anyone here who actively you know, really wanted mentorship could not find someone to assist, right? You have to, you know, you may owe them a favor. You may owe a favor that you have to mentor one of their junior team members, right? And as a, uh, you know, as a, you know, supporting, you know, how they've helped you. But I think that's just something that more people should take advantage of and, and not be afraid, not be shy. Just reach out and ask for help because it's out there and people will give it. You've uh, you may not be aware of how many people are willing to, to share, right? Uh, often we get hit by, you know, 20 salespeople a day. So someone that's not actually trying to sell us it might get our attention. So another thing to think about is when you're a leader to make sure that you're, that you're getting mentorship for your team members, uh, and making sure it's the appropriate mentorship. I've been able to uh, call in some favors and, and get some great mentors for some of my team members. Uh, I also, you know, I'm gonna use another movie reference here. And there was a movie, The Last Samurai, and, and Tom Cruise was captured by the samurai and, and he had still had some ability to, to move about their compound. And he was teaching the young boys some, some stick fighting and the samurais uh, really didn't 
approve of it because in their mind he wasn't qualified to teach their kids and uh, they, they kind of beat him pretty good. But, but as a, a leader, you got to be careful of who your team is being mentored by and making sure that they're being mentored by the right people who support the values that, that you think they should have. So. Well, I think I'm just about wrapping up here. So uh, the, la the last thing I just want to talk about is, uh, you know, think about your leadership style and, and make that intentional, meaning uh, think introspectively about what kind of leader you are and what kind of leader you want to be, and, uh, and then focus on, on doing the best you can with that. So. With that, I guess I'm out of time. So uh, thank you very much. My deck is up on GitHub, so and feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.